out of the funnies into your homes, and we hope your hearts too, the makers of Camel Cigarettes bring you Blondie. <laughs> Before we drop over to the Bumstead house to visit Chick Young's famous characters, Blondie and Dagwood, a word from the makers of Camel Cigarettes. Now, one of the things that makes Camel Cigarettes so different is that Camel's costlier tobaccos are slower burning. Recent scientific tests confirm it. But you don't need a stopwatch to tell you that Camel's are slower burning. You've got a better way of knowing. You'll find that Camel's are cooler, milder. Better tasting, too, because that slow-burning feature of Camel's lets the flavor and fragrant aroma come through to you. Your throat, too, will appreciate the gentleness of slow-burning Camel's. And, of course, the cigarette that burns slower is going to give you more actual smoking. By burning 25% slower than the average of the 15 other of the largest selling brands tested, slower than any of them, Camel's give a smoking plus equal to five extra smokes per pack. So for extra smoking and extra pleasure, smoke the slow-burning cigarette of costlier tobaccos, Camel. And now we're ready for our weekly date with the Bumstead. This time we find Dagwood with his employer, J.C. Dithers, standing in the living room of a newly completed bungalow. Listen. Well, Bumstead, is this a typical Dithers dream home or, or isn't it? Oh, oh, sure, sure. Does that fireplace look like the kind where a young couple could sit? Gazing at flickering flames and all not. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, why, that's our regular uh, number 413. 413A, Bumstead. Oh. The heart of a lifelong honeymoon, $12.85 extra. Oh. oh. And what about the furniture, Bumstead? It's okay. You mean it breathes contentment, don't you? If it doesn't, that decorator overcharge me. Hmm. Are you going to furnish all the houses you build now, Mr. Getty? Not by a long shot, I'm not. Mm-hmm. I was crazy to furnish this one. Uh, yes, sir. What? I mean, uh, why did you furnish this one? To please lock and bar Stipple. Huh? Stipple's an old bachelor with a barrel of money and a lot of romantic ideas about marriage and love in a cottage. He keeps talking about lamplit windows in an ideal home for two. Uh-huh. So he wants to play Cupid by providing dream homes for honeymoon couples, easy terms, and no down payment. Oh. If he can just put the right people in the right houses. Yes? Yeah? Claims he doesn't want to make a sense. Gosh, I wish I'd met him when I first married Blondie. If you'd waited for him to provide a home, you'd be living on a vacant lot today, Bumstead. Why? Oh, because he can't seem to find a place that lives up to his ideas. I started showing him new houses, and he said they all looked too empty. And I furnished this one. Uh-huh. And he still didn't like it. He seems to expect to find his honeymooners all moved in and holding hands in front of the fire. <laughs> Saying that's a good idea. You know what Eddie Guest said? <clears throat> it takes a heap of living in a house to make it home. Why don't you find some people, too? Well, Bumstead, I'm glad you mentioned that. I have the same idea. You did? Yeah. Oh. Only I'm not going to turn this new furniture over to strangers. I want someone I can hold responsible. Oh, sure. Responsible people is what you want. Uh, don't get anyone who would come in and start throwing parties for their friends and relatives. Uh, get someone who would kind of move in and then relax. Well, Bumstead, huh? you relax easier than any man I've ever met. Yeah. Uh-huh. How about you and Blondie moving in here for a while? Oh, no, Mr. Dennis. It's a nice place, but uh, all this new furniture and all. Why, you two could make believe you were just starting on your honeymoon. Well, who would we make believe Baby Dumpling was? Huh? Oh. Well, you could leave Baby Dumpling with the Fuddles. Get a complete change. I don't know. Uh, Blondie and I are kind of used to Baby Dumpling now, and, and Daisy the dog would miss it. Oh, nonsense. Look, I'd make it worth your while, Bumstead. No, uh, no. Oh, I've got a better idea, Mr. Dinner. I know some real honeymooners, a nice steady people, too. Blondie's Aunt Bessie and her husband, Mr. Sneevel. Eh? They don't sound very romantic to me. Sipple wants romance. Oh, you ought to see them. Like kids. Blondie and I brought them together, and I bet they'd be glad to do us a favor. But I wanted to settle the deal with Sipple this weekend. If I can do that, I can sell him a lot of homes, and besides that... I could wire... Hmm. Well, it's against my better judgment, Bumstead. Uh-huh. Anytime I leave anything to you, something goes sour. Yeah? But I'll settle for Aunt Bessie and Weevil if... It's if, evil. If, huh? mm-hmm. Oh, what's the difference? I'll settle for them on one condition. You and Blondie come in here first. Let Blondie sort of warm the place up. She has an act around the house. Then if her Aunt Bessie doesn't come, you two will have to go through with the romantic stuff for Stipple. Well, I'll ask Blondie, and if she's game, <laughs> I am. Then 
then it's a deal, Bumpster. Now, when I bring Stiffle, be sure there's a fire in the grate and soft lamps glowing all over the place. Okay. Remember, he's strong on lighting window. <laughs> But, Dagwood, yeah. we won't need a trunk, will we? Mm-hmm. Goodness, we may not even stay overnight if Aunt Bessie and Gideon get here in time. And if we did need anything extra to wear, we could run over to the house for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I brought over some knickknacks. Knickknacks? Yeah, it's just stuff to scatter around. Uh, make the place home again. Oh, Dagwood, there are too many things in this house now. I've been changing the furniture around and putting things away all afternoon. Well, just let the trunk stand in the hallway there for now. Uh-huh. Hey, it's pretty dark in here. Uh, why don't you light up the lamps, huh? Uh, Dither says Mr. Stipler is strong on lots of warm lights and stuff. Then Mr. Dither should have thought to have had the electricity turned on. Isn't it on? No, Dagwood. No electricity, gas, or phone. No heat yet. No? Except the fireplace. Yeah, that isn't burning up very well, is it? No. The wood's sort of green, I think. It's smoke. I don't think this is going to be what... Divers wants Mr. Stipple to see. Well, we'll do the best we can. I ran over to the neighbors and phoned everybody to turn everything on, and they said they would. Uh-huh. But they didn't say just when. Yes. Hey, I smell kerosene. Oh, it's this oil lantern I borrowed. It smokes, too. It doesn't give out much light, either. Oh, dear. I did want the place to look cozy for Mr. Stipple. You know, Dad, what mm. I think his idea is lovely. Furnishing little honeymoon places for people. Well, maybe the lights will come on before he gets here, and the firewood may dry out and burn. Say, what are Aunt Bessie and, and Gideon do? Any minute, I think. I got a funny wire from her. It said... Uh, hey, what's that? Oh, the front door. Yeah? I wonder if... Oh, oh, it's Aunt Bessie. Well, is that you, Blonde Bum said? Oh, of course. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Aunt Bessie. Here, Dad, we help her with your bag. Come right in. Hello, Aunt Bessie. Oh, I like your gone right on by. What, with no lights or anything? What's the matter with the light? They'll be turned on soon. Uh, look out for that trunk. Oh, here, Dad, we put her bag by the trunk. Oh. I'll adjust for now. Okay. Come on in, dear. Guys, uh, five bags. <laughs> And it looks like you've uh, you've left home for good, Aunt Bessie. And so I have, too. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Well, I say, and so I have left home. Not that I'd call that ugly big barn of a house home. It was bad enough when I was living with my family, and they used to sit around like it was awake, wishing for Gideon Sneevel to come and claim me. Thirteen years awaited, as you well know, Blondie. And if I'd have known what was in store for me, I'd have waited till doomsday before I'd have trusted my life to that man. You mean Uncle Gideon? That's who I married, ain't it? For better or worse, I took him. And how was I to know how much worse it would turn out to be? Oh, dear, you, you've quarreled with Mr. Sneevel. Well, I thought you had just come back from your honeymoon. And so we had. But when a man deserts his bride, the honeymoon is over. Uncle Gideon deserted you? Well, he's off on another trip. Packed up his samples of anchors and lit out. And good riddance to others, too. Oh, well, maybe it's just a business trip. I don't care what it is. He won't find me waiting when he gets back. Oh, I was mighty glad to get your wire inviting me here. Uh, yeah, but we kind of wanted you and Uncle Gideon both. Well, of course, but I'm not welcome. Oh, now, Aunt Bessie, Dagwood doesn't mean that at all. Well, it's just that we thought you and Uncle Gideon both being here would make this a real honeymoon kite. Oh, dear. What, what made Uncle Gideon mean home? Well, he laid it to Horace and Sylvester. You know, Aunt Gracie's boys. Oh, oh, yes. Where did he meet them? Mm-hmm. They just passed the house for a little visit. And at first, I wouldn't melt him get him's mouth. He was that polite. The boys took him so well, they decided to stay with Phil. You mean they moved in with you? Well, it seemed as if it was a small house. There's eight bedrooms in that place of Sneevel's. And that I pointed out to him when he began his rumbling. But he says to me, why can't Sylvester sleep in a bedroom then, instead of my favorite chair, he says. Oh, I see. What else did Sylvester do? Not a blessed thing. Uh-huh. I guess that's 
why Snoodle didn't take the candy to him after a while. Still fisted as a lot of thinking, and he can't do it so good unless he's lying down. Mm. Now, what does he think about? Oh, that's what he's going to be in life. He says it's a serious thing to pick out a career. Mm. He's been thinking about it ever since he was 21, and he can't make up his mind yet. That's quite a long while, Aunt Bessie. Well, Sylvester's just turned 45. He certainly gave it careful consideration. Poor boy. He's all wore out from the thinking and the worrying. Oh, and that Sneevel never would let him be. Why, when Sneevel went off to work morning, he'd complain that Sylvester was a snoring on the living room couch. And when he'd come home to lunch, he'd make him get up and come to the table. And when he'd come home at night, he'd complain that Sylvester was taking his afternoon nap in his chair. Never give the boy a minute, please. Well, maybe if Sylvester had shown a little more energy. He don't to believe it. Horace had energy and to spare. And Sneevel got mad at Horace, too. What did Horace do? Just tried to be helpful, is all. He fixed Gideon's car for him. At least he uh, tried to. What went wrong? Well, seems like the gears on the car was making a noise, so Horace up and took them out and cut it round and put them back. Uh-huh. Worked like a beaver on it. Yes. But Gideon Sneevel complained that when he was through, the car wouldn't run no way but backwards. Uh-huh. Well, he backed it out, and it backed around the block, and it backed back into the garage, and his language was a caution to hear. That's why he packed up and left out on the train. Oh, gosh, that's too bad. Well, you can stay here tonight, Aunt Bessie, anyway, and uh, then go visit your own folks a while, huh? Oh, and let them say to my face that after waiting for a man for 13 years, I up and made a fizzle with my marriage. I'll die before I ever go home. Well, don't worry about it tonight, Aunt Bessie. You can stay here and rest. For a while she can, but this isn't our house, Blondie. It's Mr. Ditter's and... Uh... Please, Jasmine. Not now. No, let him go on. I know I ain't wanted. Here, nowhere. Now, Aunt Bessie. Oh, whole family couldn't wait to get me off their hands. Gideon as much as turned me out the door. And now you. Here's in the house my going before I even took off my house. Well, Aunt Bessie. Nobody wants a lone woman. I told him. <laughs> now, now, that isn't too a bit. You come on upstairs with me and lie down. Just a burden to one and all. That's my oh, No, no. You're welcome with us, Aunt Bessie. Of course you are. Come on now. Would you like a nice cup of tea? Oh, no, so to no trouble for me. Oh, it won't take a minute to make. Yeah, not after the gas gets turned on. No gas. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Your relative. Oh, golly. I hope that isn't did it. Who is that? Uh, wait till I turn up the lantern. Oh, huh? Where is she? Oh, who? Why, it's Uncle Gideon. Where's Bessie? Now, don't tell me she ain't here, Bumstead. I found this on the doorstep. A bird cage? With her love birds in it. Of course, she left the parrot for me to feed. I, I guess I forgot to bring that cage in with her bag. What is all this stuff in the hall? Oh, a trunk and stuff. Come on in, Mr. Smeagol. What's the matter with the lights? Uh, they're going to turn them on pretty soon. I think. I don't like the looks of this bumpstead. Now, what have you done with Bessie? I haven't done anything with her. She just went upstairs with Blondie. She's pretty mad at you. Well, I've come to have it out with her once and for all. A pretty kettle of fish this is. Where will I put this anchor? Anchor? Oh, uh, one of your samples. Certainly it's a sample. I brought it to prove it was a business trip I was on. Oh, well, let's see. Oh, well, put it here in the hall with the other stuff. Now, that must be pretty heavy to lug around. Not as heavy as my heart, Bumpstead. There I was, a happy married man, when a snake crept into my Eden. Two snakes, Sylvester and Horace. Daddy, what's going on down here? Don't say I'm here yet. I want to confront Bessie. Uh, what good will that do? Maybe if I take her by surprise, I can get in a word or two before she starts talking. Well, she was crying when she went upstairs. Oh, she always does that when she runs out of talk. She knows I can't stand it. She got her voice back. Yes. Yeah. You, you sure you want to stay? They'll be down in a minute. Well, I'll just stand back here in the shadows, back of the couch. Okay. Jasper, who was that at the door? What? What's this anchor doing here? Uh, it's lying there. An anchor? Oh, that means evil. She followed me. Don't so don't take me to Blondie. Now, Aunt Jesse, maybe he's come to make up with you. And then he's wasting time. I give him the best years of my life. Oh, is that so? Oh, there he is. He's dropping me. Now, Bessie, listen. Lurking in the shadows. Sure. Stop, lurk, and listen. That's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, now let's be sensible. Don't 
come no near her, Gideon Sneevel. You stop him, Blondie. Now, Aunt Bessie, no one's going to harm you. Why not listen and hear why Mr. Sneevel's come here? Sure, Aunt Bessie, be reasonable. Oh, I'm unreasonable, am I? Because I won't listen to his smooth tongue. Well, let me tell you that I've been listening for years, and I believed him, too. I was just fool enough to think he meant it when he said he'd send me a good home. I did give you a good home, but I didn't promise a home for your whole family. Especially Sylvester and Horace, those termites. Don't make it any worse. I curse him, Gideon Sneeble. Isn't there any way of catching this up? Yeah, if those fellas would leave. Leave? Uh -huh. Sylvester wouldn't get off that couch if the house is on fire. I tried it. Yes, they frightened me out of my wits one morning, hollering fire. Oh. Yes, and all Sylvester said was, which room? And I said the kitchen was in flames. And Sylvester said, well, when it gets close to here, call Horace and ask him to carry me out. Oh, I won't sit here and listen to no more lies. I'll go. Out into the night again. Now, Aunt Bessie. Oh, she won't have to go. I'll go. Hand me that anchor and those love birds. Don't place them up to the finger on those birds. They're mine. Now, Uncle Gideon, give Aunt Bessie the birds. Dagwood, oh. you keep out of this. Who paid for those birds, I'd like to know. There he goes, throwing his money in my face. Oh, where's my hat? Up here, Daddy. Let me be blondie. Oh. This is what I get for marrying beneath me. Oh. I was too young to know what I was doing. You mean you were too old to care? Oh, Not go up there, Blonde. I've got you, Dad. Wouldn't keep them quiet. Goodness, that may be Mr. Sears after all. Oh, no. I hope not. Oh, okay. It is. Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> welcome to a honeymoon party. What was all that yelling I heard? Uh, the honeymooners. What? Well, it's Aunt Bessie and Uncle Gideon. <laughs> uh, they had a little misunderstanding. Now, listen to me, Brother Oh, my God. What's that? What's that I fell over? Just an anchor. An anchor? Uh huh. Well, what's that doing in the hall? Well, what's this trunk here for and all this luggage? Why don't you turn on some light? Well, uh, they'll be on any minute now, I, I think. I distinctly told you, Bumstead, that Skipper wanted warm, soft light streaming from the windows. And I find the house dark as a smuggler's cave. I told you like romance. And I find the hall full of luggage as if someone was being evicted. Uh -huh. I said Skipper wanted to see a happy couple sitting in contentment before their own fireside. Uh -huh. And I find the place full of your relatives, making the night hideous with their power. Oh, they'll quiet down. <laughs> Where's Now get those people out of here, Bumstead, before I spin in a riot call. Yes, sir, but let me explain. You can explain that in the morning. Skip will coming tonight. Yeah. And it'll look fishy if I'm here. Or try to head him off. He'll be here any minute, and if he stumbles into this shambles, it'll cure him of romance forever. And lose me a good customer and cause you a bad headache, Bumstead. I got a little headache now. Well, you practice getting used to that one, Bumstead. Because unless you get me out of this quicker than you got me into it, you're going to be a secretary. Hey, wait. Oh, golly. Thousands of smokers have switched to Camel cigarettes and found extra mildness, coolness, and finer flavor in Camel's slower-burning, costlier tobaccos. But Camel's also give you a generous bonus of extra smoking per pack. By burning 25% slower than the average of the 15 other of the largest selling brands tested, lower than any of them, Camel's give a smoking plus equal to five extra smokes per pack. Smokers who live in communities where certain state cigarette taxes are in effect can save the cost of the tax, and in some instances more, through smoking camels. If you live in a community where there are no added taxes on cigarettes, the savings are all yours. So turn to camels. Your sense of taste, your sense of value, will quickly tell you that penny for penny, camels are your best cigarette buy. <laughs> Up, will you? Yes, sir, here I am. Oh, did Mr. Withers go so soon? He didn't go any too soon for me. He was pretty mad, Blondie. He said Mr. Skipper would just be rambling onto a stumbles, uh, stumbling onto a, uh, oh, 
or something like that. Oh, dear. Did he hear Bessie and Gideon? Oh, how could he help it? What was that crash? Who threw what at who? Oh, that wasn't anything. I just dropped a bottle of cologne I was bathing Aunt Bessie for it with. Oh. He has a bad headache. You mean she is a headache? Now, that's what. It's just that they're getting adjusted to marriage after living alone so many years. I feel sorry for them both right now. Maybe I'd feel sorry for them if I had time. But Sipple will be here any minute looking for a romantic honeymoon couple sitting by the hearth. And we haven't got one. I know. And I feel responsible because it's my Aunt Jessie. Oh, oh, look, Edward. What? The little hall light's burning. The electricity must be on. Oh, th- th- turn it out. If Sipple sees a lot of lighted windows, you'll be here like a shot. He's crazy about it. Hey, who's that standing in the hall? Well, Uncle Gideon. Oh, eavesdropping again, huh? Uh, I'm afraid I was. Uh, do I understand that my uh, disagreement with Bessie has embarrassed you young people? I'll say. Dogwood. Well, it has. My whole job depends on it, maybe. Uh, see, uh, there's a fellow coming who thinks marriage is a fine thing. A bachelor, huh? Yes. Huh? Well, yes. But he has a lovely idea, Uncle Gideon. He wants to provide low-cost homes for couples where they can find peace and contentment. Little houses like this, just for two. Just for two? Mm-hmm. Good idea. My marriage might not be the wreck it is if I'd had a guest-proof home. Oh, well, if I could help in any way. Well, you could, by being the example of a happy married couple. But uh, only you need Aunt Bessie to. Then it's hopeless, my boy. Oh, is that so? Oh, I'm sorry, but... may I ask? Aunt Bessie. You were listening to Yes, I was, and uh, if I were speaking to Mr. Feeble, I would tell him that I was just as able to cooperate with my nephew as he is. Uh, did you hear that, Uncle Gideon? She said... I heard her. You may tell Mrs. Feeble that I, for one, would be willing to impersonate a happily married man for the period of the emergency. Aunt Jessie, Uncle Gideon said... I heard him. I can hide my feelings, too, while the company's here. Oh, I think that's very nice of you both. Now, while I'm turning on the lamp... Did you sit together over by the fire? Yeah, we're right over here. Come on. Yeah. Look, Blondie, mm-hmm. the fire's beginning to burn. Uh-huh. Oh, everything's looking a little brighter, don't we? Now, uh, sit down, Aunt Jessie. Yeah. Now, uh, you sit next to Uncle Gideon. Uh, now, hmm. now, how does that look, Blondie? Well, um, it would look a little more honeymoony if they wouldn't sit up quite so straight. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, too much space between them. Get together, get together. Well, if you'll be good enough to tell Mrs. Sneevel that I don't want to force my attentions on her, I'll meet her halfway. Oh, uh, listen, Aunt Bessie, he said... I heard him. Uh-huh. And you tell Mr. Sneevel that he can just sit as close as he likes, and I'll just make out to myself I'm on a hayride with a stranger. Oh, no, Aunt Bessie. Pretend you're still in love. Don't be childish. Listen, uh, that's him. Uh, that's Dipple now. It, it's now or never, Aunt Bessie. Oh, please help us. Give Uncle Gideon your hand. For you, Blondie. There. Good. Now look happy. Yeah, uh, look at the fire and smile or something. I've got to open this door. Go ahead, Dad. Oh, <laughs> hello, Mr. Dipple. Uh, you're just in time. I mean... You, you know me? Uh, sure, Mr. Dibbers. Oh, Dad, yes, uh, such a kindly character, Mr. Dibbers. Is that so? I mean, <laughs> sure. Uh, come right in. Oh, are you sure I won't be intruding into your happy circle? Oh, no, <laughs> indeed. We've heard so much about you. I feel as if you were an old friend already. Oh, you're very kind. Now I feel welcome. Oh, but I mustn't stay. It's enough that I've seen this happy home, been allowed for just a moment to cross its magic threshold, step into a world of content. Oh, don't run away so soon, then. Uh, why, you haven't seen the place yet. Uh, look, over, over by the fire. Ah. And they want to meet you. We well, all do. I'm Blondie, and this is my husband, Dagger Dumpster. And this is Aunt Bessie and Uncle Gideon Sneevel. Good evening. You see, you're How do you do? Now, won't you sit with us by the fire? Oh, I I mustn't disturb the happy couple. They were seeing castles in Spain and the embers, I'm sure, dreaming of their future together. Uh, well, I... Huh? Dagger, maybe Mr. Sniffle is right. And the rest of us wrong. I beg pardon? I mean, well, you've never had a home of your own, have you, Mr. Sniffle? No. A real home, I mean, with a wife. No, I... I never have. But perhaps you know more about what a home means than people who do have one. You understand so well, little lady. Oh, Blondie's great at understanding people. Just the same, I... 
I think it might be a good thing if Mr. Skipple told us what he thinks a home should be. Oh, well, I... Uh, it seems to me that a home need not be a large place. Uh, never any larger than just big enough to hold the people in it close together. Its walls set out the world and its troubles. The fire on its hearth, uh, no matter how tiny a blaze, keeps out the cold and warms the hearts around it. A real home is a place where a man and a woman face life together, face it unafraid, laughing at misunderstanding, inviting contentment, finding beauty in the simple act of living day by day. Oh, oh but I mustn't take up any more of your time. I think you've given us more than you've taken. Oh, but you all know better than I what I've been trying to say. You all have a home, while I, well, I just peer in at the lighted window and, and wish you happiness. Oh, Denny, it's quite late. I really must go. Ah, another wayfarer attracted by the gleam of your fire. I'm oh, sorry. What makes you so quiet in here? Uh, why, Mr. Sipple was just telling Mr. us. Mr. Sipple? Well, 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 you got here, I see. Most happy to say that I did. I've met the most charming people. Ah, the Bumstead, you mean? Oh, and their relatives, uh, Aunt Bessie and Uncle Gideon. Bumstead? Where are they? Uh, right over there. Uh, the ones holding hands. Those two? Uh-huh. By the fire? Yes. Perhaps you're surprised to find a honeymoon couple who are not, uh, uh, young people. But they're all the happier to find each other later in life. It's not only for the young I want to build my little homes, Mr. Dither. Oh, you've uh, decided to go ahead with your idea? Oh, yes, indeed. This house is what I've been looking for all along. Why, it's perfect. It's so snug, so peaceful. Peaceful. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, maybe if we're going to talk business, we ought to go over to the office. I was about to suggest it. Good night to you all, and I do thank you so much for a happy visit. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Oh, uh, Mr. Dillard, uh, before you go. Hey, tomorrow, Bubba says, don't you worry. I won't forget what you've done for me. So I don't know how you did it. Well, I guess everything's all right, Edward. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did it sound as pleasing as he ever does? Hey, Aunt Bessie, Uncle Gideon, they're gone, Aunt Bessie. <laughs> yeah, oh, but don't start yelling again, Aunt Bessie, uh, until Mr. Stipple is out of hearing. Oh, I, I don't feel much like yelling. That man made me, well, kind of ashamed. Me to the fine man like Gideon and, and treating him the way I have. Oh, now, Bessie, it was all my fault. Taking you into that big barn of a house and getting all excited because you had a few of your folks drop in. Suppose you moved to a small house, a cozy little place, like this. Oh, Gideon, could we? Could we? We have. From now on, we live here, Bessie. Well, Edward, looks as though it's time we've met. Come on. Uh huh? The honeymooners want to be alone. Oh. Come, dear. We'll pick up our things in the morning. Good night, Bessie and Gideon. Oh, they don't even hear you, Blondie. No. <laughs> Look at them. It would be simple good to see them now. Yeah. Sitting in front of that fireplace. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice fireplace. <clears throat> That's our regular 413A. The hearth where happy hearts will spend a lifelong honeymoon. <laughs> Blondie is played by Sonny Singleton and Dagwood by Arthur Lake, whose new Columbia picture, Blondie Brings a Baby, will soon be released. So till next Monday, we leave the Bumsteads, Blondie and Dagwood. But the makers of Camel Cigarettes have other radio treats for you during the week. Tomorrow night over these same stations, you can listen to the music of Bob Crosby and the best Dixieland band in the land with Johnny Mercer and Helen Ward. And if you like swing, well, you better make a date with your radio for Saturday night when Benny Goodman and the world's greatest swing band with Mildred Bailey bring you another musical caravan. That's a tip for your radio pleasure. And for your smoking pleasure, let us suggest that you try Camel. You'll find more pleasure per puff, more puffs per pack. This is Bill Goodwin speaking for the makers of Camel Cigarettes. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.